Hey, Pre-Sales Collective. It's your host, James Kakis. And today I'm going to be joined by Brent Krempkees, Vice President of Solutions Consulting at Gainsight. The topic of today's episode is hiring non-traditional talent. This is obviously something that's very important to the Pre-Sales Collective, which is why we created Pre-Sales Academy. And Brent is someone who is hiring non-traditional talent very well. I don't want to go into too many specifics yet because he's going to talk about those in today's episode. A number of people with non-traditional backgrounds joined the Pre-Sales Collective community looking for jobs, and some of them have ended up at Gainsight. And so in today's episode, we're going to learn what Brett is doing to interview that talent and to onboard that talent so that they're successful in the role. Enjoy. Brent, welcome to the Pre-Sales Podcast. How's it going today? Going well, James. How are you doing, man? I'm great. This is a topic that I'm really looking forward to speaking to. I'm just glad to have you on the podcast. Love what you're doing over at Gainside and appreciate all of your team members really leaning into the collective. So it's been awesome to see. Absolutely. We're excited to not only be on the podcast today, but also just everything that you all are doing. It's just been phenomenal. So I know the team, my leadership team, all of us are really enjoying the content that you all are putting out. So thank you. I appreciate that. Love to hear it. How's Q4 going? How's 2022 planning going for you? You know, it's been good. The year has definitely been a bit of a rocket ship, I would say, just in customer success. I think on the team with our solution consulting team, it's been awesome. I've been at Gainsight a long time, and this has definitely been one of the most unique years in a good way. And Q4 is looking good, so I don't have much to complain about right now. It's always a good position to be in. I've seen Gainsight put out a lot of really cool videos recently. You guys always do good marketing videos, but looks like Nick Meha, your CEO, is really out there right now. He is, man. These choreographed videos are definitely unique. I'm just glad they haven't asked me to do it because I can get on these podcasts, but anything when it comes to singing or lip singing, I'm not the best at. So I'm glad Nick's doing it. I love that. And, you know, it's actually one of the things I wanted to highlight before we got into your story in the episode is I think Gainsight has done some really great things in the market. And one of the things I admire about the company is really this human first approach. From the outside, it seems like Gainsight is more than just a business and people really feel a sense of belonging. Absolutely. You know, one of our values is the golden rule. So, you know, obviously treat others as you want to be treated. But I think the biggest thing for us right now is prove that you can win in business by being human first. And I think for me and the solution consulting team is I think that sells. And so one thing that we really focused on this year is trying to bring that into the sales cycle. So from a cheesy icebreaker, you know, it doesn't matter if there's an executive on the call, like everybody's kind of caught off guard, but everybody loves it. Like most of us are still stuck at home you know, Zoom after Zoom after Zoom, and it's all business. And it's like, if you can bring some of that human first type of element from playing music or whatever it may be, I think it resonates. And I think it helps you win in business. So I love everything that the organization has been focused on with being humans. I think the last 18, 24 months has humanized all of us much more than business. in the past. So. Great perspective, Brent. And I think what's so interesting, right, is Two years ago, if somebody's child walked on the Zoom or if their dog barked, it was like mortifying. But now it's like, oh, great. It's awesome. You know, I think we've really blended personal and professional life. It's awesome to hear that Gainsight is really leading from the front on that perspective. I want to ask you more questions there, but I got to ask you first, tell us about your pre-sales journey. What got you to where you are today? You know, it's probably similar to a lot of people. I didn't know what solution consulting was. I started at Gainsight actually more on the services side, implementing the platform. And I've got a lot to thank. And account exec Jim Murphy was in our office in the early days. And he's like, Brent, you should be a solution consultant. And he continued to talk to me about it. And then as the sales team started to grow and they opened up the roles, I'm like, you know what? This is awesome. I was always scared to be in sales because I thought of cold calling, carrying a bag, big quota. That was never attractive to me, but I always kind of had that quote unquote sales personality, I felt. But I was more of like a nerd. Like I love tech. I love being more behind the scenes. When I realized the two blended well together, I'm like, I've got a lot to thank Jim for and saying, Brent, you got to do this. And then from there, there's some luck involved with everything in life. And it's kind of what this topic today is. Also, I had a lot of leaders that I respected take a chance on me. And so as our organization started to grow and you know there were just additional opportunities that presented themselves to me, you know, we'll talk about it today, but grit. I mean, man, I saw the opportunity. There was some luck, but you got to take advantage of the opportunities that you're presented. There's a Ted Lasso quote there, but I can't think of it off the top of my head. Sometimes there's a lot of luck, but you got to work hard to get lucky. So that's awesome, Brent. And you know, I have a similar background coming from services or coming from post-sale side of the house and making that transition to pre-sales. And I think it's made me a better pre-sales professional at the end of the day. 
Absolutely, man. And you know what? Again, we're going to get into this, but that's also what I look for. It's like if you've got somebody that's gone through implementation, they know what organizations are looking for and whatever they're selling. If they know what it's like from that perspective, then I think they can sell that much better. It actually makes this job seem easier because I always say like solution consulting is like preaching the good word of whatever you're selling, where when you get into implementation, you're actually like, that's whenever people are more frustrated and you got more difficult milestones to hit and deadlines. On the pre-sales, it's like, that's when everybody's the most excited about whatever you're positioning. I'm with you, Brett. Actually, Pavel Martin was on the podcast early on. And he said that the difference between pre-sales and post-sales, because he made that same transition. In post-sales, you're actually building the house, the plumbing, everything. And in pre-sales, you're kind of just showing the Hollywood set. And that's something that always resonated with me. Because I think that like once you understand how to build the house, it actually helps you articulate that Hollywood set a bit better and a bit more dynamic. I know I've heard another one that's similar to that, which is pre-sales is almost building the prototype. So the cool new car that's coming out in five years. So you like get everybody excited to see that prototype. But then in reality, post-sales is more the engineers that have to actually build the car and you know make changes to what everybody was so excited about in that prototype. So yeah, there's all sorts of analogies here. Yeah, I love that example, Brett. So let's get into the topic because I think we're ready. Today's topic is hiring non-traditional talent. And the reason why I reached out to you, Brent, and said, hey, I would love to have you on the podcast is I know a number of your new employees who've made the transition from non-traditional backgrounds, individuals who've been engaged and involved in the pre-sales collective that were looking for roles and have joined your company and actually a few of them. And so there's obviously something that you're doing right and they've been pretty successful. So I want to talk about that with you today. Again, this is a central pillar of Pre-Sales Collective and Pre-Sales Academy is bringing non-traditional talent into this amazing profession. And so I have to maybe start with a little baseline. Is How many people have you hired in 2021? So we have hired eight this year. Now, when you look at eight, that's actually almost double our entire team. So our pre-sales team isn't massive, but nearly doubled the team this year. And of that, half of those individuals did not have traditional pre-sales SC background. When you look at it, we've got the majority of those are in traditional solution consulting. Now, a few of them are also in value consulting. So value consulting is part of my organization. Same thing in that area where they weren't traditionally value consultants, but they had that foundation that we're looking for that we can get into today. I love how many people without a pre-sales background that you've actually hired Is there anything in commonalities of their previous experience, especially with value consulting? Is there any similar background in the people that you've hired? I think the main thing is on the value consulting, both of the individuals were in industries that were being disrupted. And that's important for our specific organization because it's gain sign customer success. A lot of our customers are disrupting their industry, either from moving to a SaaS model, whatever it may be. And so these individuals were in organizations. One was in the travel industry, which obviously has been significantly disrupted between COVID and then just technology. And so for me, it was really looking for individuals that understood what disruption looks like. And from that disruption, then you can really correlate that to what value consulting is doing at our organization. It's understanding, creating business models, ROI justification. There's a big change management component to it. So that's where the disruption comes in. On the solution consulting, I would say the most similar trait is that they all had some type of technical background, which you're probably going to say, well, obviously, Brent, like that's kind of what we do. But for me, what I was looking for with these individuals is that they had actually been admins of some type of platform internally. So they had either deployed something internally or they could have deployed their platform like a post sales. But to me, it's like, well, that's already kind of cornering the market. I didn't care if they had just been an admin of outreach or been an admin of Salesforce. If they had that fundamental understanding of how things work, then I'm like, I could teach them how to sell. So that was just like, have you built it? Have you done it either for your customers or for your internal customers? That checks the box for you get it from a technology perspective. I appreciate that approach because there's so many people who won't take that type of approach because they're looking for unicorns or making sure they have ABC experience. So I appreciate that because it obviously makes sense as you say it. From my past experience, when I wanted to bring in someone without a traditional background, I tend to get a little bit of pushback from my sales organization because you'll have a lot of pressure to hit our goals. We have to hit our quota. We don't want you to take a risk on somebody because we want somebody with more experience. So how has that conversation gone with sales and getting their buy-in on this? 
you know, one is obviously with the way the market shifted, we need to become profitable. So obviously we have to be more strategic in the salaries at which we hire. Like it's obvious. So obviously if you find nine traditional, you can typically start a bit lower. Now, the reason I say all that is that kind of helped on the executive type of buy-in for this is what my team could look like. My roster, if you look at it, it's total aggregate OTE. What we first did strategically to make sense of this is we moved from an aligned SC to AE model to a pooled model. And we really focused first on what we call our general market space, which is what you all may hear, SMB, et cetera. So we cap it by employee size. So it was the smaller deals where we first started with this pool model. Where I'm going with that, though, is that helped us convince leadership that, hey, we're going to move to this pooled model. What this pooled model is allowing us to do then is to bring in non-traditional hires But if you have a strategic deal or you have something that's nuanced that requires experience, this pool model is going to allow us to pick the right SCs to be on the right deals. What that pool model also allows us to do is have higher velocity. So more deals are coming through the pooled model, which is then giving our non-traditional SCs more at-bats with less risk to the business. It's like, all right, we're going to have some bad demos here and there. Where is our level of risk? And if it's low risk high long-term reward, then it's worth it. So I would say those were the conversations that we had around, okay, here's what finance is requiring us to do from an investment perspective. This is what the business needs from a sales quota perspective. Looking at the two of them at an aggregate, like this is the direction that we went. That's awesome. And I appreciate that background. I had not even considered the pool model in this type of environment to build buy-in and get sales and executive on that same page. Makes a lot of sense. But I have to ask, Brett, Taking a risk on non-traditional talent is tough. So I want to know, what is your secret? And to further double down on that, what have you been doing for recruiting of these folks? So I would first say, so again, going back to the way we kicked this off, when I look at just Gainsight and I would think about like where the organization has pressured me from a leadership perspective is like, be human first. And what I mean by that in this is, dude, we all remember where we came from. Like I remember being 25, I live in the Midwest and I'm like, I just want a shot in tech. I'd always wanted that shot. And I was just waiting for someone to give me that shot. And I was fortunate to get the shot. And I would say it's kept me humble. And I don't ever want to forget where I came from. And so when I see candidates that I can just sense the grit and the hunger over a Zoom call, I'm like, yeah, you've got what I need, which is just that grit. So that's probably not that secretive, but it is one of my secrets. This is the other thing, James. I will give a lot of kudos to the pre sales collective. We took a shot first on one individual. What I'll tell you is most of the individuals that are in your community have a network. And this has really been a snowball effect for us. We had one really good candidate. He really started to do an awesome job. And as we started to build the team, I'm like, Brian, find me more of you. And so that's been a lot of help. We do have a good referral program within the organization. So if you're looking at it from more of a leadership perspective, like what does your referral plan look like? Especially right now, as hot as the market is, you got to lend on the rest of your team's network to build out a strong team. And I think the final one, which is probably the most strategic as you're thinking about building a team, is you've got to know what you're looking for and know where to focus on enablement in order to take a chance on someone. So for me, it's like, I know what I was looking for, which was, again, have you built something either internally or for your customers that have some type of similarity to our platform? Again, for us, a lot of that is around CRM just because of what our technology is. But I knew what I was looking for. And then what that allowed me to do is I had a pretty good idea where we were going to have some gaps. And so that's where I worked with our enablement team around. So what messaging, tell, show, tell, like all just like the little SC tricks. The big thing for me, honestly, with finding these individuals was teaching them how to sell and stop training. That's probably my big thing. It's it's so hard when you come from a service background like myself to not be always click here, click there. It's more of that training mode. And I'm like, no, you are selling. It's a different way to talk about a platform and to get everybody listening knows that. But that's where I worked with our enablement team. Like, this is where we're going to have to probably spend the time on that enablement. But again, man, the big one, I would say, you got to take a chance on someone. No one went to college to become an SC, or maybe they do now, but they didn't when I was in college. So none of us are going to have the perfect background. Everyone listening to this, someone took a chance on you at some point. You've got to return that. I believe in karma. Well said right there. I mean, we could end the podcast on that quote. I mean, it's the mic drop moment. I mean, people have taken chances and I do appreciate the shout out to the pre-sales collective and the network that we've continued to build because you're right. So many people do not know about this role. They don't plan on going into this role. And then once someone takes a chance on them, they could prove that they're successful. It is a snowball effect. You're right. And there is a referral aspect of that network. 
But for us, I've seen so many people say, well, this is exactly what I'm looking for. And as I already alluded to this unicorn per se, there are so many other things beyond like previous SE experience that makes somebody successful in the role. Obviously, I'm a bit biased coming from post-sale and talking to people who've made that transition. But I think you've really nailed it by saying that you have to have a program to support them, which I want to dive into. But more importantly, you have to know what you're looking for. What's so interesting now in my perspective is I get a lot of people who reach out to me who tell me about their experiences. And there are people that are going through hiring process that are non-traditional talent that go through seven, eight, nine interviews. And at the end, they're told, well, you don't have the experience. It's like, how are you going to do that to somebody? Set the expectations in the beginning. And I think that's just like one of the things that is so misaligned right now is like, you have to understand exactly what you're looking for, the good that comes with that, the bad that comes with that, and build a program to lift everybody up. So I love that you're doing that. By the way, man, I saw you post this on LinkedIn the other day. And I actually love the first comment that I read. I wish I had the name because I would shout out to him. But he said, send me this profile, which I loved, which it just shows again, what you all are doing in the community, because the first response was, I'll take that awesome candidate. So I love it. It's great, Brett. And actually that individual has gotten a couple interviews out of that post, which was unintended, but it's cool to see. That's awesome. You've already mentioned grit as something you're looking for in the hire and somebody who owned the system, but how are you testing for that in the interview process? You know, I think for me, honestly, on that, it's a nearly impossible thing to really know in an interview, obviously. So for me, I'm very transparent in what the expectations are, where I have concerns of that individual, and then truly being able to understand how do they demonstrate it. A lot of it, when I say demonstrate, it's more in conversation that we can overcome whatever those gaps are. For me, it really comes down to just transparency. I mean, anyone can make stuff up in an interview, but I think when you are very open with them to understand like, hey, here's are some gaps in enablement. As a perfect example, no enablement program is absolutely perfect. So I'm very transparent around, hey, here are some gaps and improvements that I see in our own internal enablement program that you're going to have to get over. How are you going to be able to solve that? Another interesting one that I've started to see a lot lately that I love is unique follow-up to interviews. Like Loom videos, I'm getting a lot more videos that could be 30 second, a minute and a half. That's just a follow up like, hey, Brent, thanks for the time. This video response is such a unique experience. That alone right there right now kind of sells me because I'm like, oh my God, I love it. And then we're actually kind of a side note. We're starting to do that more actually across the pre-sales team. I picked it up from an interview candidate. And now I'm like telling my entire team, I'm like, hey, follow up to meetings with these little Loom videos. It really resonates. People cannot not watch them. And then you can follow up and everything else. So I love that you brought that up because, you know, I have a fundamental belief that the details are the difference between good and great. That is like our methodology with Pre-Sales Collective, right? We always try to make sure that we care about the details because when you combine them together, it really creates a totally different experience. It can elevate. And when you think about candidates and you think about hiring process... You're looking at 10, 20, 30 resumes. What stands out in those resumes? You take 20 of those people to interviews. Like what makes them stand out? And you're right, the follow up. And I love the creativity in the follow up because to your points that you've made, it humanizes the experience even more. And so I like that perspective because you're going to remember that. You're going to remember that and stand out. You're like, wow, that person went the extra mile to get this job. They want it, you know? Yep. You know, one other thing that I should have said when I test for grit is, Anytime someone looks at my LinkedIn, not to toot my own horn, but I've had a pretty quick rise. And what I love is when individuals that are interviewing ask me how I did it and what they need to do to do the same. So one, it tells me they've done their research on who they're talking to, which is 101, but people don't do it. Especially in this market. Yeah, exactly. But when individuals are genuinely interested in it, I see what you did, Brent. How can I do that? I'm like, okay, then I know that that's what they want to do. And that, again, is just one small demonstration of you want it, you've got some grit. So that's probably just another one. The curiosity of candidates too. And people show that they're hungry. This is what they want. They want success in their life. I want to get tactical for a moment. What is your actual hiring process if you're willing to share? Obviously, I work a lot with recruiting. So we'll have different roles. We do have some more senior roles where I am looking for someone with some experience. But again, specific for this, when we're looking for these more entry point into pre-sales roles, it's just to the typical type of recruiting. So James, with as hot as the market is right now, I'm also doing a lot and my leadership is doing a lot of just going on LinkedIn and I'm sending a lot of just LinkedIn introductions. That's kind of 101, but man, you know what? I always tell my SC leaders, this is like AEs not building their own pipeline. 
you can't just hope that SDRs or BDRs are creating your own pipeline. Same thing with pipeline for candidates. Like you've got to own it at the end of the day. If you're running any type of team, like it is your responsibility at the end. So that's probably one thing that I'm annoying to my leadership is you've got to be building your own bench. But then when you get down to the actual hiring process, so we just do three 30 minute interviews. So it would be one with recruiting, one with the SC manager or myself. And then we also would have them chat typically with one of the sales leaders that would be aligned to whatever functional team that SC is tied to. So three 30 minute interviews, I don't know how much it resonates over podcasts. It's a pretty laid back atmosphere. It's not like super structured. This is more of like, why do you want to be in pre-sales? All of those just kind of what we're talking about right here, James, nothing super formal. And then once we check those three boxes, we do go into a 30 to 45 minute panel interview. So what we do is we just send over, it's a massive deck of Gainsight, kind of a first pitch deck. What we'll also do is then give that individual a demo instance into Gainsight. And then obviously it is, here is the business problem this organization is looking to solve, do a five to 10 minute presentation via the deck, and then jump in and do a 20 minute, 30 minute demo. And so we've gone back and forth on, should we let them demo something that they're familiar with? Should we let them demo Gainsight, et cetera? I think what's unique, again, as you're looking at individuals that have never done this, they might not have something that's easy. Like I had someone do a demo one time of QuickTime just because they didn't demo it. It didn't really resonate because I'm like, all right, this is not... Apple may say that that's an enterprise platform, but again, it's hard to demo. It doesn't relate very well to Gainsight. What we've done then is we give them about 10 days to go through this exercise before they actually have to present because it is an investment. It's not easy. And we give them the opportunity to ask as many questions along the way. We obviously give them a bunch of our canned demos so they can hear how we position it, et cetera. Now with that, I'll tell you, the things I'm really looking for is one, do they understand what we do? Can they correlate what this exercise prospect is actually trying to solve? And how does that actually correlate to what we do? And then in the demo, it's really then, do they understand how the platform can actually solve whatever that challenge is we're looking to solve? The demos aren't perfect. There's a lot of training involved. We don't try to like stump the chump or we make it as relaxing of a role play as possible to give the candidates some confidence. But we're really just wanting to understand, can they articulate the platform to what the organization is looking to solve? Do they have some type of general understanding? If they have that foundational understanding, we know that they've already done some implementation in the past, then it's like, all right, they got the technical chops, they get it. Then we can run them through our enablement plan to really then help them learn how to sell. So that's our process. And I think it's worked pretty well. I didn't look at our success, but I bet of everyone that goes to their panel, 70 to 80% of them get hired. Meaning if you can get through that interview and then you actually invest the time, you're usually doing pretty well. We've sniffed out, again, the candidates that may not be good fits before we get them to that panel because we don't want them. It's a huge time investment. So that example you mentioned with eight to nine interviews, this is only four interviews, but it's still, it's like, man, I don't want to waste hours and hours of your time. We already know this is probably not a fit. So we try to do a lot of that upfront because again, man, the market's hot. We're all busy. And honestly, personally, not to be selfish, I don't want to waste my time either. No, I don't blame you. I mean, it is a hot market, right? And I think it's also a candidate's market as well. And if you make them jump through too many hoops, they're just going to go with someone who also has an easier process. But I really like that you've really set them up for success. At the end of the day, if you've given them materials to make them successful and see the energy and effort that they put in, which is obviously really important in the interview process, the comment you made about stump the chump, I feel like too many interview processes are how do we trick this candidate to make them look bad? It's like, no, just set people up for success so they can be the best version of themselves so you know what the potential that you're hiring to. That is beyond me and probably a conversation for another day. I will tell you, James, like my team laughs at me because I'm obviously just an optimistic. I always look at the bright side of everything. But man, honestly, by the time we get to panel, I am cheering these people on. Like I probably want them to do better than they want themselves to do because. One, I'm trying to hire and I've got a need for these roles. And I'm like, I've already invested two hours into this candidate. Like, just please knock this out of the park. I would love nothing more at the end of this panel to say, you crush this. I'm going to get together with our internal recruiting and you're going to have an offer in the next day or two. And I love nothing more than ending a panel interview with those comments. So, Brett, you mentioned this a couple of times. So I have to ask, 
When it comes to the enablement and supporting these folks, you've talked about the process, bringing people in, they've interviewed, they've done well, they got the offer. Now they're in the organization. Tactically, how are you supporting them? Because as you've mentioned, you're going to have to teach them a bit more than you'd have to teach somebody who has previous experience. So, you know, like a lot of organizations of our size, we do have a sales boot camp. It's a two to three week boot camp. That's SDRs, AEs, SCs all go through it. So everything from prospecting, account planning, first pitch decks, they are part of that. I think that's really a foundational thing that they need to understand how all roles are involved in moving an opportunity through the sales cycle. So that's one. We'll do weekly SC team enablement. So that's usually more around the tech. So, you know, if it's new releases, if it's new technology, et cetera. So that's kind of the general stuff. What I would say is huge right now, and if anyone listening to this isn't doing this, I would strongly encourage you is gong.io scorecards or whatever technology you use to record. I don't want to be partial to gong, but we love gong. They're a strong partner of ours at Gainsight. But we basically created a Gainsight solution consulting scorecard. So it's five components. So it's around what's your overall presentation. So that's where I'm just looking at, you know, how much interaction was there? Did you move your mouse a lot, et cetera? So just typical presentation. The next one is, did you demo the right solutions? I tell everyone like our products big, did you demo what they needed to see or did you overwhelm that? Then I also look at, did you use customer stories? Cause that's probably a big one with new SCs. Do you have customer stories? Can you actually relate the, so what back to what they care about? Are you feature functioning? Or are you selling? Anyways, what it's doing now is it's giving consistency. So now, one, I can be transparent as an organization and just say, hey, this is where you're doing well. This is where you need room for improvement. I would say what it's helping the most with is when new SCs start, and maybe boot camp doesn't start for three weeks, we used to just say, go listen to gong calls. Well, then I would listen to some of their gong calls. And I'm like, why did you do that? And they're like, well, that's what you did in this gong. And I'm like, That's not what you want to repeat. Actually, that was bad. And so then I started to draw and I'm like, okay, gong calls are awesome, but new SCs don't know the good, the bad, or the ugly. I started to see some things repeated that I'm like, yeah, we probably shouldn't do that. So anyways, this scorecard has been huge. It's also just allowing me as a leader to start to understand maybe where there's aggregate scorecards that need to be improved. So it's given me both an individual training and then that team training. The final one is, and this is more once they start to get enabled is don't jump to conclusions when you get feedback on these new SCs. And where I'm going with that is, obviously, we've had some challenges with every SC on my team. Whatever it is, this is a relationship job and there are going to be AEs and SCs that don't get along. What I would say is like, I've had some tenured AEs that have complained about newer SCs and you start to peel the onion back and it's more just a relationship challenge or a style challenge. So when you hire these new individuals, you're going to hear things that aren't always the best. Don't jump to conclusion. Again, you know, there's two sides to every story. Everybody needs to be enabled. But to me, that's probably a big one. And it it, it kind of goes back. That's where that pooled models help. So then we just know like, hey, these two work better than the other two. And it kind of works itself out. It's great to hear the foundation that you have. And you know, I actually love that you send everybody through sales boot camp because I think it's actually really important for people to understand sales process and BDR's role and AE's role because it just kind of lets the puzzle fit together. I think early in my career, I was like, ah, they don't need to learn that. But you know, like my new people didn't need to learn that, but they did. It helps make everything make sense a little bit better. So it sounds like you have a solid foundation. How have these folks done? Have they been successful in the job? They absolutely have. Brian, Zooey, Andrew's new, Ali, they're all doing phenomenal. They're all on the board. Some pockets, we've got longer sales cycles, but they're all on the board. They're all adding value. What I love about it is they're all doing things very different from each other in terms of their style, the way that they're working differently, the way that they approach deals. So for me, again, one of our values at Gainsight is Shoshin, a beginner's mindset. And I really love bringing these new individuals on that they're adding a whole new perspective of how we're selling our platform and different ways of getting things done. So again, I cannot say enough good things about this experience so far of taking a shot on people. It's helping me grow. It's making us just a more diverse team, which is also important. Right now, I've seen nothing but positives. There's been no negative impact whatsoever to adding this. Good for you, Brent. I've really enjoyed this conversation. So I have to ask you for an advice question as we close. We talked about the current market that exists out there. And in my conversations, right, I talked to leaders who are struggling to hire who won't take a risk on someone without experience due to a multitude of factors. What advice do you have for that leader who's struggling to hire and isn't necessarily willing to take a risk on someone without the experience? I would say just take a shot. 
For me right now, having someone in the seat that's excited is better than no one in the seat at all. Again, I would say take a shot. Remember where you came from. But when you're actually talking to this, again, be transparent. And when I say transparent, I'm transparent around what's the OTE of this role going to look like? What are your expected hours going to look like? But I think more importantly right now with the market, I'm super transparent of where we are in the hiring cycle. I will tell a candidate, if I get on the phone, I will say, James, I like you, dude. I'm going to move you through this process as quick as possible. Just so they know, because every candidate you talk to is probably talking to five other organizations. So I don't want to be like, oh, we're going to get back to you. Now, maybe if I'm not a huge fan, I may say that. But if I like you, I'm just going to say like, hey, we're going to move quick here. You keep me in the loop. If you've got ops open, I'll do the same for you. But I think the big one is take a shot. And again, don't just lean on your recruiting counterpart. They're awesome, but you got to do it yourself. So get a quick LinkedIn message and just start pounding the phones, as they say. It's like a proof of concept, right? Get one person in the door, show that it works. And it's like, okay, this actually worked. Like maybe I could try switching up my mentality on this. Brett, it's been awesome having you on the podcast. Love the work that you're doing at Gainsight. Love how you guys are taking this approach to hiring and bringing in non-traditional talent. Appreciate everything that Gainsight is doing and leaning into the pre-sales collective and getting involved in the community. Absolutely, man. We couldn't do it without you all. So we thank you as well. I'll talk to you next time. Looking forward to hearing how uh, non-traditional talent is six to 12 months from now. Can't wait. Thanks, man. All right, Pre-Sales Collective. If Brent hasn't convinced you to take a risk on non-traditional talent, I think you need to listen to the episode again. I love that Brent talked about somebody taking a chance on him. And all of us have had people who've taken chance on us in our careers to get us where we are. And so Brent has made that part of his DNA in terms of giving back and giving people an opportunity because he could teach them to sell. And as he talked about getting them from that training mindset into a selling mindset is something he can do as long as they've owned the product and they understand technology. And for what Brent has created, it's not without risks. Hiring non-traditional talent has its risks, but Brent has a real plan. And it starts with building buy-in at the top levels of leadership with your executive team of finance and sales and making sure they understand what the role is and how it brings value to the organization. And even specifically, Brett talks about a pooled model with their general business, which is sometimes known as SMB and other companies. So a little bit smaller deal sizes for people to learn. Not only is it about creating that infrastructure internally, but identifying what you're looking to hire for and understand the risks that come with that hire. And then streamlining the hiring process as well. And then the final presentation, Gainsight gives a very tailored and specific demo scenario, but gives the candidate about 10 days to go and prepare and gives them that resources. And as Brent said, he's rooting for them at the end of the day because he's setting them up for success. And I love that Brent said all of his new individuals are already on the board. And those are big wins and great momentum to get early in your career that can create that snowball effect. So for anyone who is wondering, should I take a risk on someone without a traditional background? You must first ask yourself, do I have a system to make sure that this person is successful? But I think that there's so many times we surprise ourselves by hiring someone without the background and having mismanaged expectations and they go and exceed them. You know, I think we need to continue to think outside the box as it comes to this profession. After listening to this episode, if there's someone that you think should get into pre-sales, send them the pre-sales academy. Have them check out our website, understand what we're trying to do there because we firmly believe this is the best job that nobody's heard of. All right, pre-sales collective, as always, I will see you next week.